Hello, welcome to Star Wars Belt Out. I'm your host, Josh Chapman, and today we've hit 100 episodes of this ridiculous little thing that started a couple of years ago. And um, lucky enough to have uh, a guest over the phone who is a, a singer, a songwriter, a podcaster, an entertainer, a, a, a bit of an activist as well, and um, more than anything, loves his Star Wars. Um, Darren Hayes, how are you going? I'm thrilled to be on your show because I'm a fan. And also, I thought you were going to make some joke about since this was the 100th episode, you'd get someone really old. <laughs> he, he, Darren, who's 100 years old as well, just coincidentally. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so it's really great to be here. Thanks for, for having um, me. I'm not that much younger than you mate so i wouldn't i wouldn't worry too much about that so uh <laughs> don't worry there's plenty of star wars fans that uh, you know the ages all cascade down from uh, from one to whatever age we are they cascade down from uh like 100 down to george lucas ruined my childhood so yeah this is a whole gamut yeah. yeah i wonder how those guys childhoods are going at the moment if they're still ruined if oh, they've just kind of forgotten about it like around 99 <laughs> it was really yeah, around 99 it was pretty ruined but i kind of forgot about it after a while you would think now given what's going on with uh, i don't want to be a downer but you know I, I feel like now it's like they're probably really grateful for everything even i i didn't love the prequels but now i'm like got any more of them prequels <laughs> yeah <laughs> i've been inside i've been inside for weeks got any more star wars prequels i can watch <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I'll take them anytime I can get them. Uh, how's your um, How's your lockdown? How your lockdown going? Uh, you know, probably the same as everyone else. There's the polite answer that we all give, which is that um, that you know, which is like, yeah, we're doing okay. But then there's the sort of more realistic answer, which is that um, the you know, it's, the it's, it's, I think it's just <laughs> all on a different level. Yeah, in that it's. Uh, um, it's a sudden halt and this abrupt halt to our daily rituals, which is, mm. I've, had, I've, I've had a little trouble adapting to that, I'll be honest. Um, but thank goodness for, you know, movies and music and TV and podcasts, because we've, we've all been throwing ourselves into that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's kind of funny in Australia here, because like, they, they, you know, people started losing their jobs and getting stood down and stuff. And this is the coronavirus talk, but we'll talk about it because it does link around, especially to, to, to your background. And, and then, then um, the Prime Minister came out and said, oh, don't worry, we're going to prop up everybody with uh, this JobKeeper thing. You'll all get a wage while you're off and da-da-da. And, you know, great, great work, you know, important. But the arts was just absolutely left out in the cold. And it, it, that's what everyone's leaning on at the moment, you know, because they're all sitting around. You know, where do you think all this Netflix and music and everything comes from? Absolutely. And also just, you know, like to try to swing it even back to, to Star Wars, which is that I really, really miss going to the movies, you know, and it makes us, when we're locked down like this, um, you realise just that the whole concept of uh, the entire industry from whether it's grips and lighting people to script supervisors to catering all the way through to little old me who just loves to go to the theatre and just see a movie and get lost. I, in some ways, I'm so glad that for me, the last big movie that I saw was, uh, you know, 18 times of seeing The Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> is, is, <laughs> is, is that, a, is that an I, exaggeration? I know you saw it a lot. Is that actually oh, the number? That's the number? Correct. Oh, yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Um, I, yeah, I saw... Um, so for, some, for whatever reason, you know, I, I, was, I grew up obviously in the 70s, so mm -hmm. Star Wars is a given. I love the original trilogy. Uh, the prequels weren't really for me, uh, and that's cool. And then um, when J.J. was announced and The Force Awakens was, was, was coming, just from the very first trailer, I was just something in me just said, yeah, this. I'm, I love how it looked. I love how it felt. It just... I was on board, and I, I feel like I love the new trilogy as much as the, the ones from the 70s. And, um, yeah, I, I made a point of going to see them a lot of times in the theatres because when I was a kid, we were, like a lot of people my in my neighbourhood, we weren't, you know, we were kind of poor, and mm -hmm. going to the movies was a huge expense. Yep. So I never saw... I saw The Empire Strikes Back at a drive-in theatre once, and I saw um, Return of the Jedi once in a movie theater. So as an adult, 
to go and have that ritual of like the excitement of Star Wars on a big screen and for this time around for it to be a trilogy that that for me it really connected to me and yep. my age and my, and my nostalgia it was like a second childhood loved it so does yeah, it so 18 <laughs> 18 times wow so does it like i know um you've spoken about star wars before and and you sort of you know you, that, that that sort of shot you know luke standing out looking at the twin sons wondering about his future and where he's going to go and you know you look at that and you as a young man looking at that and um you know feeling that connection with the young luke does do you then go new trilogy and do you connect with old Luke or do you go do you see something in someone like Ray more or is it you know do you do you, do you clutch onto the the characters as they're older now that you're older or do you look at the the new younger characters and that's where you're sort of getting the the thing that really speaks to you? That's such a great question. Um, <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> I never thought about it until now, but you know what's funny is that. Um, I connect to all the characters in different ways. So I understand the cynicism of Luke. Mm -hmm. So I understand that the the challenge that Ryan had really was that there aren't happy ever afters. A fairy tale ends and then the next beat is always that life continues on, right? So the, the end of the first trilogy was a fairy tale that ended with a happy ending, but then, of course, life goes on. And the only way you could have used those characters was to show what happens to you 30, late, 30 years later in life. Um, and I, so I totally understood, you know, um, I didn't, it, it, Ryan's movie is probably my least favorite of the three, but they're great films. But yeah. I understood why he had to go that way with, with Luke and, 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 and Leia and Han especially just killed me. But you know what's funny is the characters that I identify most with the new ones, Ray and Kylo. I understood that whole idea again of, um, you know, the search that we all have of purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, wh- wh- why am I here? Wh- why have I been given this um, dream? You know, uh, if I relate it personally, I think a lot about being an entertainer, you know, yeah. just because you're talented at something, whether you're a, a musician or a, a podcaster or a dad or uh, an Olympic athlete it doesn't always mean that you'll be the best at it. And, yep. and, um, and sometimes that dream or your destiny can be a curse. You know, we, we try to avoid our destiny. And so that hero's journey, it, it happened again in the new trilogy. It really connected with Ray. And I, and I loved the conflict of Kylo. I thought that was such a, he's my favorite. I would say Kylo Ren's my favorite Star Wars character. Well, he's a guy is, who's sort of, like he, he he's sort of weighed down by the he, he's obviously weighed down by the expectation of his legacy as you know what i mean like he's sort of mm. he, he's a guy who who you know comes from you know the stock of han solo and the skywalkers and stuff and kind of rebels against you know doesn't want to feels like he has to break free of that and um, kind of forge his own path even if that means he, he has to go bad you know in order to do so um yeah to kind of find his way around but um i also cause... think like Sorry, man. I, no, I, you go, go for it, I always also think with Kylo Ren, like I imagine the, what it must have been like after the first trilogy where you're sort of this royalty, you know. You're, it's almost like you're Prince Harry, you know, or you're Paris Jackson, or mm. you're the son of this royalty and so much is expected of you. And you would naturally want to rebel against that. But I love that with Ray. There's no one else in the whole universe that understood what he was going through. And yep. yet the tragedy of how you're someone, I'm requoting someone else, but the tragedy, I think Chris Terrio said this, screenwriter, but imagine if your soulmate was your enemy. Imagine yep. if the only person in the world who could understand what you're going through was your complete uh, opposite and, in fact, standing in your way. And um, just that moment in the last film, you know, where... No one had ever really done anything kind for him. He's a monster. And yet she saves his life. And that moment really just moved me. I, th- I think, um, you know, in, in general, it's so hard to have compassion for our perceived enemies, you know. But at the heart of every conflict, there's always just someone is just hurt. Well, you know, it, I, don't, of, I don't I'm getting all deep, but yeah. yeah no, man, that's, that's good stuff. It's, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a guy who knows his stuff. But like when they're on that Death Star wreckage and they're kind of, like, it's like they're almost just sort of 
like chopping wood. They, they kind of don't want even want to be there. You know, they're kind of just fighting because they're being they're under almost this expectation that they're supposed to. You know, like they're kind of chasing each other around the galaxy in this little little dance, and then they confront each other on that Death Star wreckage. You know, the war and the waves is going around. As the fight goes on, they, they kind of just like, what are we even doing here? You know, like the the, the fatigue kind of sets in, and it's just like. We're either going to just kill each other here, or we've got to find another way, really. And that's, you know, Kylo kind of stops and hears his hears Leia, and then, um, you know, Ray sort of takes the opportunity to, to to knock him down. But then, as soon as it happens, she realizes she's she's made a mistake. Yeah, which is wonderful, isn't it? Because I think any other villain, um, you know, like for example, with Anakin in the prequels, you know, his first kill, it felt good. Yeah, you know, it fed it fed into his anger. Uh, whereas for her, it was great that I, you know, I personally loved that she was a Palpatine. I don't think there was any other way you could go. I know that it caused a bit of controversy, but I just love the fact that it's like everyone's saying, you know, why is she so strong in the Force? Like she must be related to Skywalker. And it's like, no, it's worse actually. She's related to the most evil person in the galaxy, and. Uh, just, you know, the idea that you are defined by your blood um, is turned on its head. You know, I always think about it in terms of, like, cycles of abuse. Mm-hmm. You know, I think anyone that can survive um, trauma in their childhood um, and maybe have compassion for their oppressor or compassion. Not that forgiveness and compassion are two different things, but, you know, that the whole idea that, that she has every right to want to lash out because her life has been destroyed by forces bigger than her. Um, But she chooses to just, you know, save Kylo Ren and whatever. I guess I'm a Raylo. Look at me. (laughs) You did your your 18. What's what's opening night look like for you? Do you have a certain place that you, you know, do you get your tickets as soon as you can and have a certain spot you like to sit and take people with you? Or do you fly solo opening night? What what does an opening night Star Wars look like for you? I love that you know this stuff because it's important. <laughs> uh, it's never, it's always with uh, the general public. I never go to a screening, even though it's so tempting. Um, and, you know, I'm very spoiled that I get offered a few opportunities like that. Mm-hmm. But I always want to see it the day that the public see it. I I, I rent uh, a whole row and usually write it, invite about uh, 15 or 16 people. Yep. And... Um, I want to feel that initial rush and that thrill and get that reaction of a first night crowd. Um, and then I did various, <laughs> I do various versions. So I probably, when it, when a Star Wars movie comes out, I probably see it uh, two days in a row, then have a day off, then one day, then two days off. And I do that for about two months so that, uh, uh, and see it in various versions, various uh, situations, various seats, like, it is an obsession, and I'm very aware of it. Uh, but it, uh, it it's great. Was it different? Like, if you see it that many times, do you? Are there certain things like audience wise that you notice happen all the time, or is it, is it really like, ah, oh, some people really jive with this bit, some really jive. like? I saw it five or six times, I think, and I found that the less I got away, the further I got away from the opening, you know days when you've got the hardcore fans and just sort of like the general public the, the reactions were slightly different like um did you sort of find that the more you went on or you just went no nah, everybody sort of loved this bit or people always sort of this bit was weird for people or was there any sort of pattern that you found or you're just focusing on the film uh yeah i do I, I, it's funny I, I i really do notice that stuff i, I sort of watch vicariously because i think what i'm trying to do is I'm trying to imagine what it's like to see it for the first time again. And um, I notice comedy beats most more than anything. So I'll notice which bits get laughs mm-hmm. and um, which of my laughs are sort of polite laughs. <laughs> Sometimes I'll, I'll start off a laugh. Like I, I remember uh, uh, there's that scene in the Pisana Desert where uh, 3PO says, you know... Um, I can't remember the line, but he essentially says something like, "It's uh, how lucky they are that it's the Aki Aki oh, Festival and yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever." And everyone just turns around and just looks at him, and they're just so over him. And I love how long that shot is, and the confidence of JJ to have held that shot so long because it takes a while to get the joke. And sometimes I noticed 
I would be the first person to kind of snicker and then the audience would get it. And then other times I'd be like, I just want to see if they'll get this bit. <laughs> they always did. But, but there were other things that, you know, I would listen to conversations in the, uh, in the hallway afterwards, you know, some people were like, that was, what was that? That was horrible. You know, or like, what? Whereas other people were like, that was incredible. So definitely a variety of reactions. And, and I found it fascinating. Uh, yeah. To just kind of, realize that it it wasn't uniform um, no at all yeah it, it was it was weird because it was just a different it yeah i it's, it's hard to dissect the film as a whole you know like it's like the last jedi you you kind of point it and you go oh i can see these are the reasons why people wouldn't jive with it you know the treatment of you know, the way they characterize someone like luke and you've got to yeah. really accept where he's coming from in order to, to, to sort of to roll with it and stuff and i was quite happy with it i found it quite quite interesting but like my my cousin who's a few years older than me who got me into star wars he had a real problem with luke in the last jedi and like it nearly killed star wars for him for a while and then mm-hmm. at christmas time i saw him and you know he loved the rise of skywalker and he was back you know and and it, it you know that was all it took for him to to, to, to sort of to, to get back on track i think but then yeah it, it it's, it's always hard with a final chapter to, to to please everyone isn't it like there's if you're always having another film it's like well they'll, they'll fix this yeah. or something will change when, when you kind of go like let, let's be honest, Star Wars isn't going anywhere. But like they're talking about this, you know, the Skywalker saga kind of ending and put a little bow on these nine movies and stuff. When you when you're actually trying to wrap something up, it, it's it's almost impossible to to land a plane and keep everyone happy. Yeah, I can't think of any other way that JJ could have done it. And um, this isn't a criticism at all of Ryan, but maybe it's a criticism of perhaps the the planning process. Now, in, before I say this, I will say that. It's common knowledge now, even though sometimes we like to rewrite history. When George wrote Star Wars, that he did not know that Darth Vader was Luke's father. No. None of that was written in. He, obviously, he didn't know that Leia and Luke were related. Like those things. <laughs> I hope not. Obviously, you know, and to pretend otherwise is just stupid because, yeah. you know, you do these things. And then you think, oh, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if this happened or that happened? And that's how Star Wars evolved, right? Yeah. In some ways, that's a tradition. But, the, but I feel like the only criticism I have of the new films is because, in hindsight, they realised that Star Wars was famous for revelation. To have really had one common uh, through line, I was shocked to know that the films were sort of handled maybe like the originals, which was like, I'm going to, JJ's going to set up this thing. Yeah. And then just going to give it over and just see. It's almost like Mad Lib. And yeah. we're just going to see what Ryan does with it. So. Two huge things Ryan did that I absolutely loved. Um, the forced connection between Ray and, and Kylo was extraordinary. Developing those characters the way that they did in isolation and having them have this secret, forbidden, personal, emotional, psychic connection was so new, and mm-hmm. so interesting, and, and such a wonderful, wonderful thing. I loved that. Um, and I liked the idea of a reluctant Luke Skywalker. I thought that was, that was interesting that Luke, um, you know, that Luke had, uh, you know, some reservations. And so we would be let down by our heroes, which is very common, Mm -hmm. you know, with, you know, how many times have you heard stories about when we meet our idols or celebrities? (laughs) So I kind of understand that. Um, I could have done without casino planet and the world's (laughs) slowest chase chase. (laughs) <laughs> um and uh um i just you know wasn't a huge fan of that character yeah, uh, yeah but in general uh you know in general there's so much of that film that, that, that was a gift but in 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 the third film i think it was you know it was very challenging to have to wrap it up after that because essentially um there was no reason for a third film in a lot of ways um, it almost felt like the Last Jedi ended the trilogy, yeah. even, and it was just two movies for me. So I don't know. I mean, that was that was my opinion, but yeah. So I felt like they had to introduce another enemy because once you've, you know, once yeah. once uh, once Snoke is gone, uh, and he was, he wasn't a particularly strong villain anyway. But once Stro- Snoke was gone, it was like, well. What do you do? You know, you, do you just have her face Kylo again, or do you have something bigger at, at play? And so I, I thought it, it was a logical decision. Well, especially if you're going to, you know, if you're going to redeem Kylo 
as well. And, you know, Star Wars movie, I mean, a lot of people sort of leading up going, will they, won't they? And I always kind of thought, well, it's Star Wars, of course, he'll he'll redeem himself at the end. But in order to do that, you need a, another protagonist. You, can't, you know, you can't sort of have them butting heads and then Ben going to the light side and then you're like, well, now what, now what do they do? Like, they just walk off and everything's cool. But um, just putting your, your artist hat on, you know, and obviously you're a very, very you know, well-known musical act in Savage Garden for a long time and, and you know, a lot of fans and, and, and that kind of stuff and stuff like fan expectation. Do you relate to something like when you see fans, you know, sort of turn on what they expect on stuff? Do you sort of sympathize with somebody like Ryan Johnson where it's like, hey, I want to break out of the box. I want to do something different. I want to turn it on its head a little bit um, and I know not everyone's going to love it. 100%. I, that's, I love Ryan and I, I feel like I've never met him, but... You kind of feel like he's your friend you don't have, isn't he? You know, just the way he... Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? He made... I, I, I so admire the fact that he made a film that he's so proud of and wanted to make. Mm. And he did subvert expectations, not just to be clever, but just to be the way life is. Life yeah. doesn't roll out the way that we think it's going to. And I... And, uh, so I do, I do. I hope I made that clear because I love. Oh no, 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 totally, I totally. I just thought more that <laughs> as a guy, you know, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think the the, the thing is right. Um, Bono said this once, and I always remembered it. Your temptation, I think, as an artist, is to give people what worked, and and we as fans think that what we want is what we've had before. But if you serve that up you get crucified for it. Yeah. People say, oh, God, it was just a rehash of this, that, or the other. And that was one of the criticisms of the first, uh, you know, of The Force Awakens. Not for me. Loved it. <laughs> for me, it was, it, was a, it was a bit of a course correction, and I was down for it. And the minute I saw BB-8, I went, that's new. That's cool. That's Star Wars. God, that's hard to do. The minute I saw a cruciform lightsaber, I was like, what? <laughs> yes. So here for this, like, all of it was just so exciting to me. Um, but if you give people what, what it is that they're asking, you know, we all have that head cannon. We've all got, look, I've got versions of the films I could pitch to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in every single one of the new films, I'm like, wouldn't it have been cooler if this happened and then that happened or this person or that person? Hey, come I've on in a couple of weeks the... and we'll do it again. <laughs> well, I'll do it. Like, yeah. I would love to have a, like, a what if because I've got all, right. all sorts of We'll book it in. We'll do the what if series with Darren Hayes, you know, going yeah, but, forward. But, but, but the reality is I think anyone's job as an artist is to give people not what they want but what they need. Yeah. And I think what you need is to be surprised. And I don't mean that by like, um, a surprise like when Luke threw the lightsaber over his shoulder I was like okay what <laughs> but I mean a surprise like um, when Luke said it's time for the Jedi to end you know to die I came here to die I was genuinely like what yeah you know like that it's so hard to do as an artist and you wouldn't ask for that you wouldn't say to somebody hey I'm you know, I love Luke Skywalker. My last memory is him throwing away his saber and saying, you failed, Your Highness. I'm a yeah. Jedi like my father. He like pins and needles like, this is a true hero. What? Now I hear I was like, you know what? I uh, I, I can't. I quit. I, I can't do this. You, you need to leave this place. Like, wh what? That That is something unexpected. Similar in um, The Rise of Skywalker, when lightning came out of Ray's fingers. Oh, yeah. Well, the first time that happened, I literally screamed out in the theatre, <laughs> what? And I was terrified. And I was like, and she was horrified. And she's looking at her hands. And I wish they had had the courage to kill Chewie, but I understand they would have been crucified for it. But yep, yep. that moment was horrific. That. Yeah. To me, is the kind of storytelling that we as fans, we'd never write down and say, could you please have Ray have Force Lightning come out of her hands and, and kill Chewbacca Explore in Chewbacca. a horrific <laughs> space incident? Yeah. <laughs> it's just funny when Blowing you're talking, uh, just before we just doubling back around, when you, when just when you said, oh, you know, I, I remember when Bono said something, and I thought you were going to say, oh, when Bono said, I didn't really like the casino planet, I thought you were going to say that Bono was going to make some sort of Star Wars. Quote. I'm like, wow, there's some insight that, you know, that, that you don't usually get. No, but, I wish. But find out what uh, Bono finds <laughs> on, uh, what he thinks about um, Canto Bite. Um, going forward, like, do you, have you got involved in the Disney Plus stuff? Like, did you, did you drive on Mandalorian? Have you got a baby Yoda 
you know, sitting on your mantelpiece or anything like that? Was that <laughs> did that get you excited? The idea um, of being able to watch Star Wars at home, like I know you're saying that like you love the theater experience. Were you? I, yes. How was it yes going for no. you doing that? It's a strange one because I just think we're so spoiled, you know, in Star Wars fans. There's so much content. Part of what I loved about Star Wars was how rare it was, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example within the, even within the universe of Star Wars. Um, one of the things I didn't love about the prequels was that it made everything seem a little bit more connected and a little bit more uh, less special, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, I loved the idea in the first trilogy that the universe was sort of this Wild West... Um, I didn't like knowing that, say, Yoda once met Chewbacca, you know, or, yeah, um, yeah. uh, so, so for me, the idea of even like lightsabers, you know, like I always thought of the lightsaber as this incredibly rare artifact. That's what I loved about the force awakens was the, the reverence that showed for this artifact of like, what is this ancient weapon? Mm-hmm. What is this thing? And I saw say like, I don't know, Clone Wars cartoons or whatever one, or uh, Attack of the Clones, you know, when there's an arena filled with glow sticks. <laughs> yeah. To me, it dilutes it a little bit. But listen, I, that's my opinion as someone who those things are not made for. I'm not the target audience, and I totally respect that. Yeah. The, the Mandalorian, I love John Favreau. Forgive me for not remembering the female director's name because that's part of the problem here, but my favorite episodes were the ones that were directed by uh, the same female director. Deborah Chow, I think it was. Um, Deborah Chow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Loved those episodes. And uh, I think the casting in general is great. Um, I really enjoy it. I'm looking forward to more. There were some episodes that I thought were a bit like, eh. Um, yeah, it's a pretty the- general feeling for a bunch of fans. It was a yeah. bit of way down itself, a little bit in the middle, but and then sort of finished finished off strong. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I'm excited. I mean, I would, I'd... Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a hard one. Like, I never really got into uh, Rebels or Clone Wars, and I know that's sacrilege ab- along, amongst a lot of us. You know, I was never a fan of the expanded universe. I yep. So my connection is very, very niche, but I'm proud of the fact that I feel like I exist within a fan group. Like, for example, um, uh, Brian uh, Swankmatron. <laughs> oh, yeah, yep. Um, right, you know, he and I have totally opposing views about the prequels and whatever, but I'm proud that I exist in a fan community where we all get that there's now so much Star Wars you can sort of pick and choose which bits are for you and it's all cool and it doesn't negate the other people. That's the only if I only if I have one criticism about Star Wars, it's not about the creators, it's about the way some of us fans behave so we, toward each other. It's just Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely. Just really bore, and, it, and ultimately boring. it's just a you know, it's just a fun thing to enjoy. It's it's not life or death. It's just it's just silly. And you know, I always sort of see like I I have a pretty curated timeline personally with Twitter and stuff. But you know, when the the really little kid centric stuff for Star Wars comes out for the little cartoons and Galaxy of Adventures and Forces of Destiny and things come out, and people are like, oh, what is this kitty garbage? And like my four year old, you know, that's her Star Wars. Like she loves Ray through those things, and she knows who Princess Leia is, and that's that's her way in. I'm just like, well, wow, you know, I didn't. If I'd had that at that age as well, that probably would have been my way in too. Uh, you know, m- moving moving up into the movies when she gets a bit bigger. You know, like she doesn't. She's not. Super super interested in the movies at the moment because they're a bit too intense for her but um she loves those little cartoons and and you know totally the, the dolls my, my uh, yeah my goddaughter loves uh yoda and she loves et because i have toys of them and like for example right now uh i i am about to after this call i i've been reading books to my goddaughter on video to send them to her just so that we because i used to be with her like every once a week I used to yep. sit her once a week for the last three years so uh, I just bought The Galaxy Needs You, the one that um, Daisy Ridley read uh, online. Yep, yep. You know, and like I, it's important for me selfishly that I can share things that I love with someone, a, a young person that I love, but mm-hmm. also that I lo- I'm excited to introduce Ray to her. Oh, for you sure. You know, she's a wonderful hero and role model for a girl. And um, yeah, those galaxies of adventure things are fantastic. And when you go to... I don't know if you've had the chance to go to uh, um, Galaxy's Edge. Yeah. No. <laughs> the plan was to go 
because uh, Celebration was in Anaheim this year, and um, we had a crew go over to Chicago last year for Celebration, which was the first one for a lot of us. And then when they announced um, it for Anaheim, we were like, yep, great. We, we booked a house like opposite Disneyland, and we booked days in to go to Disney, and, and it's all just sort of, we don't know. It, it hasn't been officially called off yet, but we, it's just a matter of time. I think, I think they'll probably just push it to next year, I think. I have so, tickets. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have tickets. Well, I never thought about that, but what month was it supposed to be? Was it- End of August. Uh, so it's a little bit later than some of the other stuff, so I think that's why they're holding their powder. But, I mean, it, it's like it, from an Australian point of view, you know, wrapping back around to the, the state of the world and stuff, that they're not going to let us out of the country anyway. Like, we're, we've, almost, we've almost kicked this thing here. We've been quite lucky, but they're not going to let anyone You guys in. have been amazing. So- Australia <laughs> amazing about it all, yeah. Um, well, they just announced another uh, travel ban here. Uh, well, an immigration ban in the US today. Yeah, right. So, I think for everyone's benefit, it's probably good if it if, if it yeah, doesn't happen. Yeah, and it's not a it's it's kind of a sporadic the date the ways that they do it. They kind of pick and choose the years that they do it. And because there's no major movie this year, they can just push it to to a year, and it's not really going to matter. And if they just say, "Hey, your tickets stand," and we can if we can change our flights and and our our, our, <laughs> our Disney themed house, which is what we the Airbnb we put booked having to be disney themed which is pretty hilarious um is you know we, we can just move that to next year then we'll just do that um it'll be a bummer not how to go now how old will your kids be next year if you go uh well they won't be going she'll be olive will be five and my other daughter sloan will be two so we did talk oh. my partner and i had talked about going maybe bringing them over and doing disney and stuff but we kind of thought uh, we could wait a few more years and they're a bit older and they'll probably really enjoy Absolutely. it more <laughs> Especially coming from Australia, it's such a lot of money to spend. You kind of selfishly want to—not uh, selfishly. You kind of just want your children to remember it. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Year old. And it, it only takes one meltdown to ruin the day, you know. So it's just sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> let's just wait. And, and I was lucky enough to, to Kat let me go to Chicago la- uh, last year, and, and she was oh. happy for me to go. So that was sort of my my present to so myself. So great. And, so Listen, hopefully, my first. I went to the first ever one. Uh, which I think was in London at the XL Center. Oh, right. That wasn't the uh, one in the, in the mud, was it? There was one early on that was a muddy, I don't know. When, when you were in London, well, was that, were you living there? Or Yeah, so um, my husband is British, and so it's such a... I'm from Brisbane originally. Of, yep. uh, I'm 47 now, but I left the country. I left Australia when I was 23, 24. Right. So I lived in the US for almost 10 years. Uh, and then uh, went to England, met my husband. We lived there for almost, I'm getting my math wrong, but maybe nine years. And then we've been back in the States. We moved here permanently um, almost five or six years ago. Yeah, we were probably in London at the same time. I was in London from oh five to 2013. So, yeah. Yeah. 2004 to, yeah, 2004 to 2013. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so the center was incredible and um i met a lot of my good friends here in la at the anaheim celebration oh yeah uh, james uh arnold taylor the voiceover artist and uh just kyle newman like a lot of a lot of people um uh who are in our you know fan community and podcasters but also act in just talent people for some reason i ended up being invited to do like a live uh, show, uh, which is like a, uh, a quiz show, and I, I won it because I was I'm a, I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just so exciting because it was uh, the one in LA was uh, when Force Awakens comes out. But my point was, when you go to Galaxy's Edge, you're going to see all these kids running around, and you're going to just it's for everyone, and it's so exciting and so immersive and. It's a similar feeling to um, celebration, but man, you're in Star Wars. Like it's it's un freaking believable. Yeah, I'd love to go. I'm just it'll happen. Like it's not going anywhere. It's just eventually the world will, world will sort itself out. Hopefully, and we'll get to to do all those things. And it's a bummer about celebration because we we're all pretty excited. Because like last time it was the first time, and it was a bit like everything's new and and you're meeting your friends. Some you know some internet friends for the first time. Other friends you haven't seen for a long time. And <clears throat> it felt like this year we'll just hit the ground running. You know, because everyone will be there, and you'll just you know get up and go and. And you know, no new movie means it'll be more socialising and things. But um, yeah, it, it's it's good to know that it'll eventually it'll come around again. I'm just really grateful, given everything that's happened, that um, they managed to film 
and complete the three uh, films in the latest trilogy before the virus hit. Mm. Because um, they've given me so much joy. Um, it hasn't been the easiest time in the world to live in the United States since um, Trump was elected for me. Mm. And yet every two years I had this tent pole moment, which was a Star Wars movie coming out. Um, and that's been a joy. I'm, I'm glad that we, we got that. And I, I figure with Celebration, um, this will end. You know, this whole crisis that we're going through, and it will end. And uh, I think the fruit will be the much sweeter for it. So, um, well, hopefully we can be- um, walk the floor and, you know, shop for toys or something, you know. We'll we'll, uh, we'll have a little catch-up and that'd be, we have to- that'd be awesome. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I am a fan of the podcast, man, and uh, I think you're really fun oh. on Twitter. I'll bring you a. I'll, I'll bring you some merch. I'll bring you. I'll bring you a hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always bought Richard. Uh, is it you guys that have got the McClunky T-shirt? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I almost bought bought that for Richard yesterday. See, so if you get an order from Daryl Haynes from Soundgarden, that's probably what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gosh, I, I I just had something lined up. Oh, um, what was I going to say? I've just totally lost my train of thought. Then. We got caught up on McClunky, on McClunky talk. Um, McClunky, I know McClunky. So, oh, that's where it was. Um, talk about like the, the the new films, the the sequel trilogy. What about something like Solo? Did you did that did that jive for you? Did you feel weird having a like, different Han Solo? Was that kind of like it's it's Star Wars, but not as we know it? <laughs> I really dug Solo. I thought Solo was good. I liked Rogue One. Um, I thought Solo w- was. Um, I would love to have seen what, hap- what would have happened if uh, the original directors were let- left to do their thing. But yeah. Doug, it, I thought he was, I thought uh, uh, he was brilliant in it. Um, I dug it. It was fun. Rogue One was really cool. I mean, I'm not one of those people that think it's better than the new, new films, but Gareth, again, like, could there be more adorable directors of these films they're so happy to be doing their job and yeah the last you know the last 20 minutes of that film are some of the best star wars ever filmed like it's, it's unbelievable it's kind it's of amazing fun. that like which if you sort of stop and you take stock and it's very hard to do so these days is just stop and have a think you know about something as trivial as star wars and you kind of go oh man like just think of all the stuff that we've gotten in the last five years five or six years it, it you know considering we, we had those those three original films that we we watched over and over and over and over and wore the VHS down and you know taped them off the tally and did all that kind of stuff and and, and that's all we had and played played that and, and and then all of a sudden we've just been given this plethora of new stuff but for the most part has been pretty great. It's been really good and you know everyone that works on these things I think people forget sometimes um, and you know what it's like you know as a creator you don't sit down and and put all this hard work into something uh, for the hopes that it won't be good, you know. I think, you you know, there's a lot of goodwill uh, that goes into the creation of of all of this stuff, all of this content. And I don't know, I think for it to be centred around really decent life principles, you know, Star Wars as... um, as a, a set of moral lessons, you know, to go back to Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, but mm-hmm. for a way, the George's way of like inserting that and giving us these modern fairy tales, um, we're really, I, I, my life is better off for having them. You know, I often refer to, you mentioned before about Luke looking at it, the twin sons. And I think I felt like that a lot. I think a lot of young people do, um, you know, when you're growing up and you know that you've got, you've got this potential mm. and you, this desire, but you're not quite sure where to focus it or what to do. And you're always aware of when you're not on the right path, but finding the path for you can seem so challenging and dis- and disparaging. And um, I know I love that we still have those moments, you know, we, at, like you're a dad, I'm a godfather, I'm an uncle. Like, I love that I get to pass these stories on to the young people in my life. But also, I'll be honest to you, when, when life gets tough for me, I've got my Star Wars blanket. <laughs> I, you know, I'll yeah. go and the, the reason I see these movies so much for me, and again, I don't want to be like a downer, but I'm, I talk very honestly about this, about mental health, and I talk about the way that I grew up. Yeah. I had a really traumatic childhood, and I think for me, 
what I love about Star Wars is that it's always there for me. The reason I can see a movie many, many, many times is one of the survival um, uh, mechanisms I think that anyone that's had trauma or been abused is you look for things that you can rely upon. So for me, when that scroll starts up, as much as I want there to be surprises the first time I see the movie, there's a comfort for me in knowing exactly what's going to come. Yeah. All these things that I'm going to look forward to, all these challenges in the film that the characters will face that I know that they'll overcome eventually. And every time I put that video cassette in as a child, uh, or every time I bought that movie stub uh, in December last year, a lot of the times for me it was it was uh, just a warm hug in a, in a in a world that can be very confusing and random. You know, I I always know I can escape into this universe. Yeah. Where somehow or or another, everything's going to be okay. Is it? Um, and that's, that's, that's a great it, thing. Yeah. yeah, I just think about like you personally as somebody who you know went through a period of your life where you were like you know really famous, and um, obviously the the way you get treated changes and the way people treat you change and it becomes harder to to you know i i don't know anybody personally who was as famous as you but i have a, a cousin who's a reasonably famous actor and stuff in during periods and he, you know he talks about the way he gets treated at certain things it's hard to trust people um does it does star wars sort of like you know star wars doesn't care who you are doesn't care where you come from it's the same you know it gives you the same feeling everywhere the expectations don't change no matter where you are in your life whether you're you know just a kid or somebody who's very famous like you were at one stage or, you know, a different part of your life now? Is it sort of like a constant kind of thing? Yeah, I love that you said that. you got a great way with uh, phrasing questions, man. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I think like a lot of people I got into, I'm really proud that I'm still here and I'm alive and I think I'm a pretty decent human being. I've mm-hmm. definitely messed up, um, but I'm so grateful for having had the opportunity to kind of just, grow and and have positive experience from from being in the public eye but i got into it um because parts of me were sort of broken yeah there was there were two driving forces one was i had an unstoppable uh, urge to express myself and perform and i'm so grateful that i've retained that it's the, the performer part has definitely taken more of a back seat but i never stopped creating yeah. But the other part of it was really just to kind of fix something that was broken. You know, I thought that if I got famous, um, you know, it started even at school. You know, if I was, if I sang, if I had this funny personality, if I could be good in the school musical, people would stop picking on me and they would notice me for something else. And yeah. Yeah. I could create this persona that would be a shell and it would get me through the, through the, through the world. And, and, and one of the blessings of being having all of my fame happen in the beginning of my career and that being the most famous and most successful I ever was was in the beginning of my career and when I was the youngest I ever was, was that I got to realize very early on that that didn't soothe the parts of me that were broken. And so I, I really just did shift gears. Yeah. And, um, and, and yes, I love what you said about Star Wars because I identify with, I identify with the anonymity of the hero. Yep. And it's very hard, I think, when you're young and you first become famous because you don't realize it, but after a while, everyone that's in your orbit, just by the very nature of the demands of the job, everyone that's in your orbit is on your payroll, and everyone that's on your payroll becomes your friend mm-hmm. until, you're not pay- until you're not paying them anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, interesting you're saying about you know that you, you become famous younger and then it's you know it worked for you because you realized that it wasn't the be all and end all and wasn't going to solve everything mm-hmm. early on but I guess yeah. it also meant that because you know you're early in your career and you've got a lot of stuff in front of you you're not chasing that thing you know you're not willing you're like i don't need to step on anybody in order to get it because i know it's not as important anymore like i don't need to exactly. break next i'm not still you know 20 years down the thing and i'm still just like chasing that next thing and i'll you know i'll kick anybody out of the way who gets in my way yeah, and also that I'm not desperate to hold on to it. I think now, after so much time has gone by, I think I've pretty much proven that. That I think <laughs> I, I, I'm lucky that I was just that it was. Then I became fortunate enough to take artistic risks 
and be able to make things that were hit or miss, but they were made from a very pure place. In the yep. same way that we've been talking about Star Wars content, you know, yep. the things that I've done since Savage Garden have come from a, or just a really genuine place to want to put good out into the world or, or to test myself uh, or to grow as an artist. Um, and there have been many opportunities or, or things that I could do to try to get some of that attention back, you know, be yeah. on a TV I was just wondering, like, why is Darren not on, like, The Voice and stuff like that? I keep going, you know, he's, like, you know, because I don't know you super well, but obviously <laughs> from the, the way you are on Twitter and the way you present yourself, it's like, oh, you know, he's way more interesting than most of these people. <laughs> but I always just figure you're just like, ah, oh, I just kind of like the way things are. I do. And and I think, I've you know, I've had opportunities where that, that – I've been considered for some of those shows sometimes and had real moments where I thought, oh, my God, do I even really want this job? I don't know. And my way – uh, of being involved in those shows was, has been so fun because I've been just sort of casual guest or a mentor sometimes. And yeah. I saw up close, I wouldn't want to do what they do. It's exhausting. You wouldn't be able and to go to Star Wars place. 18 times in a row, you know, all of a sudden exactly. if you're on The Voice every night, it'd be like, God, you see yeah, Darren well, Hayes in Star Wars? 17 times he's gone in. Yeah, for me, being famous or, um, I don't know, anything that takes me away from what the core joy is, which is really just music and creating or, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that I've done. I just don't, I haven't spoken about it yet because it just hasn't been released or it's not yep. coming or I might have decided to bin it or, um, you know, there's things that have been negotiated. But I've never stopped being creative, but just, just in isolation. You know, I, I, I don't need to be famous. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of I how Luke wanna... felt, you know, like by the time Last Jedi, Luke's on that thing. Like, obviously, he's there for many different reasons, but he's also sort of talking about the myth of Luke Skywalker, you know, that Luke Skywalker is this thing um, that doesn't really mean anything or the expectations that came with it. He was quite happy to, you know, he had to kind of find a, a place that he was happy with by the end of the film and things. But sort of the idea of, you know, Darren, the pop star, you know, that can be <laughs> deconstructed as well as a little bit as like, you know, Luke Skywalker, Jedi master. Not all of that, you know, Character, the, yeah. myth, the myth is a different thing to the man. Sure. And I think we all have them. I just, you know, I think the thing about uh, my version of my life is that mine was just on a bigger uh, canvas than a lot of people. But I think we all deal with that. You know, that's mm. the idea of persona. You know, like uh, if you could come from a family where you're expected to be successful financially, you yeah. know, because your, your big brother is a doctor or you know, you could have the op opposite thing. You could come from poverty and you should you could be given the first person mm. in your family to be the chance to go to uni and you yeah. expect, like, or we all have these. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and I, and I think the, the idols that I look up to, um, the musical idols that I have are people that are, are a bit reclusive. You know, I think of uh, uh, Kate Bush. Um, I, I think of uh, people like Annie Lennox, Peter Gabriel. Yeah. Uh, Gautier, um, people that just sort of, it might take seven or eight years, but when they put something out, it is what it is. And um, I've never really made, uh, the, it, I was accidentally a good pop star. I never, <laughs> sat, I never sat around and, you know, was desperate to fame. I think intrinsically I'm quite a shy person yeah. who has, yeah. who has a button that I can, or a switch that I can flip that's like, uh, I'll make it topical. It's like my hyperdrive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then I can turn that on on stage and that's a real part of me, but it's not, it's not most of me. That's yeah. just a part of me that I get to do. Um, that's my version of, of the force really. You that's know, sort of a convenient, a convenient time that sort of, you know, the, the sort of the late nineties, early two thousands, it's sort of before the internet really blew up and that sort of constant, you know, no escape you know what i mean like i'm sure you felt like that sort of at the heart of your fame regardless but you know it had the idea of like everybody with camera phones and social media and everything it would have just been this sort of you know like you're saying that there's no sort of real accidental pop star kind of thing like i feel like now it's a lot more curated and, and manufactured to a point i suppose or there's you know so much more stuff is monitored um that you know it's in order to have a career, um, the mo number one thing that a manager or a label will look for is what's your social media presence. Mm. And we were lucky. We were a mystery. We were an odd. Uh, we were we, the odds were against us succeeding. 
and we did in spite of that. And I, I remember it was this incredible period of like going to shopping malls and doing signings and there were just every single floor of a Westfield shopping centre was just filled with screaming fans. And <laughs> I, it was incredible. I'm so grateful that I got to experience that. But I also was, I'm also grateful that that didn't, that wasn't what did it for me. I was, I, I have such a personal connection to the people that listen to my music and, and Savage Garden music. And mm-hmm. the audience, obviously my audience is obviously so much smaller than what Savage Garden was, but it's, I'm very grateful for that connection because I was going through such a confusing time in my own life and I got to express that in the way that I looked and the way that I dressed and I toured and, and all that stuff. And, and I looked out into the audience and I just saw people that, that said it was okay to be me. Yep. And, um, and I love that. I, and, and the, the bond that I have with my music audience is very similar to the bond that I have with my Star Wars fam. Yep. I feel like, you know, we have that understanding that, Oh my God, we all thought that we were the outsiders, but actually, no, we're all just individuals. This whole world is just full of, we're all quirky and nerdy and different in our own way. And the difference is this time, uh, we get to say that that's, that's cool and that's okay. And we get to find ourselves in little pieces of each other. You know, I might be the person that digs, uh, Clone Wars, but you know, those, two Deborah Chow episodes of, or three of the Mandalorian, I'm like, ah, oh, I'll fight you to the death over how good this is. And- <laughs> well, it's where somewhere like yeah. celebration is so, you know, was such a big experience for so, you know, for so many of us coming over as well, especially, um, you know, feel, feeling like you, for some more more than others, my, my good friend Catherine, who's been on the show a bunch of times, you know, she, she talks about how, you know, she, she, had a hard time expressing her fandom and she was younger as well, especially being a, a woman in fandom and stuff. And then going yeah. to celebration and just people just bang, got it. Knew exactly what she was about. Grew completely on her level. And she, she, you know, said it was such a big deal for her to have a sense of belonging straight away and finding these people that um, were just completely on the same page. Reminds me of a, a line from the rise of Skywalker. Um, I think it's, Oh, forgive me. I'm going to forget her name. Uh, Poe's love interest. Oh, Zori Bliss? Runner, Zori Bliss. When she says something along the lines of, they, they, meaning the oppressors, they want us to think that we're alone, you know, that there aren't that many of us. And the true, you know, the true, the truth is that actually there's more of us. You know, yeah. I think Lando says at the end, you know, there are more of us. And when you walk through those, exhibition halls you realize oh my gosh you know there are actually there's there's nations of us Mm. um and when you know when you're alone in your um in your own thoughts or you're uh, alone in your fandom or uh even for me you know when it was the that lost period of star wars (laughs) sort of in the late (laughs) 90s where it was like oh where do i go there is a place for everyone uh and it's yeah, I think that's what it is. I mean, fandom in general, when it's healthy, when it's inclusive, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to use all these PC words, but it is so important like to realize, to, to be able to see yourself in others. Um, I feel very empowered with uh, the the way gender has been. Um, there's an equilibrium now in the Star Wars storytelling, um, in the way characters are, in the fans that show up and express themselves. Now I'm hoping for more female directors and writers. I think yep. that there's a lot of balance in the story group. What I'd like to start to see now is, um, you know, more female directors, uh, you know, given, given the franchise, that would be a wonderful thing going forward too. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, the more the merrier. And like I said, if, if the content isn't for everyone, it doesn't hit every person, I think it's impossible. You know, if they keep making stuff that, has its has its niche then they can give more opportunities to more people because they can you know they can keep making more and more of it um they were that there was too much ice cream you know what i mean that's my <laughs> thing i'm like you, you're at baskin robbins okay you're at ben and jerry's are you going to complain that there's too many flavors give me a break 
just get the one you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let us enjoy the rest, you know. <laughs> exactly. Um, hey, man, it, it's so good to talk to you. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, my pleasure, mate. Um, Thank you. Um, very, very I will apt. take you up on the offer oh. of coming back. Darren Hayes rewrites the Darren Hayes rewrites the movies um, specials. Maybe we'll do them every every month or every quarter or something. We'll work that out. We'll we get the pitch um, each other different ideas. We'll have a writing room, and I'll pitch you an idea of what I think the original story of Ray and Kylo could have been, and you can just tell me it was terrible. Oh, and then you can send me snake emojis. It'd be great. I love it. All right. Well, we'll take we'll take this conversation, or you can speak to uh, you know. I'll get my people to speak to your people, and uh, you know we'll go from there. But um, look, people obviously know know you who listen to this, and you're you're a force on, online. And um, you know, and, and, hey, you know, go pop your Savage Garden Epperian or one of Darren's um, solo albums, and have a, give it a spin. You know, like I, I was a, a grunge kid in the '90s, but hell, I still you know had Savage Garden on my iPod and stuff as well. So I, you know, it's there's still some great stuff there. So. <laughs> Me, I think if you're someone that's like, who is this guy? Number one, thanks for listening because I love being a part of the Star Wars community. That's amazing. But, you know, if you're someone that doesn't listen to pop music or I wasn't ever on your radar, I reckon a, an album called The Tension and the Spark might be the way in. Boom. You might be like, oh, I didn't realize that guy wasn't completely uncool. <laughs> so, <laughs> on a Star Wars podcast, yeah. <laughs> thanks so much for talking to me. No worries, man. I'll see you soon. See you online. Bye. Bye.